Welcome back to this week's episode of The Emily Show. Today, we are talking about the audacity of this attorney again. No, I'm not talking about those chat GPT lawyers in New York. I'm talking about Alec Murdaugh. But today, it's because the attorneys for the Satterfield Sons have responded and are asking for sanctions. And whenever request for sanctions is in the header of a motion, my immediate response is immediately, yes, let's, we need to break it down. I will give you a quick road so far of what's going on in the Satterfield versus Alec Murdoch case. But man, oh man, am I excited to dive into this filing today with you. So let's get into it. Welcome to The Emily Show. I'm Emily D. Baker, the internet's go-to legal analyst and big fan of the cursey words. I've been a licensed attorney for over 17 years. I'm a former prosecutor, and I break down the legal side of pop culture and entertainment stories we can't stop talking about. We should just get into it. Let's go. Today we are talking more about the tragic case of Gloria Satterfield. She didn't expect to go to work and fall downstairs, whether caused by dogs or not, and leave her two sons. And unfortunately, one of the things we have to talk about so you don't end up in legal battles like the Satterfields is life insurance. So I'm thankful that our sponsor today is Policy Genius. Policy Genius was built to modernize the life insurance industry. Their technology makes it easy to compare life insurance quotes from America's top insurers in just a few clicks and you can find your lowest price. With Policy Genius, you can find life insurance policies that start at just $25 per month for $1 million of coverage. Some options offer coverage in as little as a week and avoid unnecessary medical exams. Policy Genius has licensed agents who help you find the best insurance for you because they don't work for the insurance companies. Policy Genius is for anyone that has people that depend on them. What I appreciate is that they simplify the process of getting life insurance so you can protect the people that you love. There are no added fees and they keep all of your personal details private. No wonder they have thousands of five-star reviews on Google and Trustpilot. Your loved ones deserve a financial safety net and you deserve a smarter way to find and buy it. Find out how easy it is today. Head to policygenius.com slash Lawnard or click the link in the description to get your free life insurance quote and find out how much you can save. That's policygenius.com slash Lawnard. Let's get back to today's show. As you may remember, there are a lot of civil cases going on after Alec Murdaugh's criminal conviction for the murder of his wife and son. Yes, he is sitting in prison while all of this is pending. Yes, his friend Corey Fleming has taken a plea deal so he can serve his time in federal prison. Yes, Alec Murdaugh, for now, is still serving his time in the prison system within South Carolina. There is an insurance lawsuit going on that has now become interwoven, intermesh, intermingled with what's going on with the Satterfield lawsuit. So the Satterfield lawsuit was originally filed in September 2021 between the Satterfield sons, Alec Murdaugh, Chad Westendorf, Palmetto State Bank, Corey Fleming, and then Corey Fleming's law firm. There was a second complaint that was filed that expanded on those allegations, added in Bank of America and the fake forge, some of what happened in this case is the underpinnings for what is in that 22 count federal indictment that just recently came down that I've also covered. There is now a very extensive Murdoch playlist if you want to see all of it. I feel like this is there's the murder case and then there's like the audacity cases. We're in the audacity cases realm. So in Alec Murdaugh's insurance case, his insurance company is suing him saying, hey, we paid out the Satterfield claim, two different insurance companies, but we paid out the Satterfield claim for millions of dollars and you lied about the insurance claim and where the money went and then stole the money. Give us back the money. That money wasn't for you. That was for the Satterfields. The insurance money never went to the Satterfields. So the insurance company is suing Alec Murdaugh. In his response, Alec Murdaugh said, actually, there should never have been an insurance payout because I lied and defrauded you about all of it. I never should have paid an insurance claim to Gloria Satterfield. It was not a fall caused by the dog. It was her own fall. It was, you know, a medical issue. Therefore, 
This is accidental. There never should have been an insurance payout in the first place. In fact, I lied about the dogs. Why? Because in South Carolina, there is just strict liability if your dogs injure someone on your property. So Alec Murdaugh is saying that he made up the lie about the dogs after the fact. And in fact, the Satterfields never should have recovered anything. Of course, the response to that is, yeah, well, you made a confession of judgment in the civil case with the Satterfield Sons versus Alec Murdoch. Then Alec Murdoch filed to remove that confession of judgment. And oh my goodness, that was a wild motion. I will list that down below. So Alec Murdoch said, actually, I want to withdraw the confession of judgment. The lawyers say we found out new facts afterwards because Alec Murdoch confessed a $4 million judgment to the Satterfields, admitting, well, some responsibility, but not really saying responsibility for what. It was a very vague, very vague confession of judgment. And that is part of the grounds that Alec Murdoch is asking to have the confession of judgment set aside, right? So that's where we are motion-wise. And the attorneys for the Satterfields have now filed an opposition to Alec Murdaugh's motion to remove that confession of judgment that they are entitled to. He said, yes, yes, I'm responsible. Here's a confession of judgment for four plus million dollars. Do I think the Satterfield sons will ever see millions from Alec Murdaugh? No, I don't. I don't think he has millions that anybody can find. But Alec is now trying to get that confession of judgment erased essentially by the court and the Satterfield attorneys have a whole lot to say about it. So these attorneys are Eric Bland and Ronnie Richter from Bland Richter, a South Carolina law firm. Thankfully, Brand Bland Richter made this available on their website. I'll put the link down below if you want to read all 127 pages of this motion for yourself. A lot of it are attachments. We're going to go through the base motion. I have not gone through this yet because I want to go through the motion for sanctions with y'all together. So that is what we are doing today. Let us dive on in to this motion. So this is the memorandum of law in opposition to motion for relief under rule 60 B and motion for sanctions. So bland Richter is coming out swinging as they said in the media that they would after the attorneys for Alec Murdoch. Am I surprised? No, because I was absolutely flabbergasted that Alec Murdoch was making a motion to withdraw that confession of judgment. And I still think, I'm going to soapbox for a second. I still think that Alec Murdoch might have issued that confession of judgment to use it at trial if the prosecution started using the financial crimes. Because Alec Murdoch's song and dance at the murder trial was, I've admitted to everything but not the murders because I didn't do the murders. It was like, look, I admitted to this and I admitted to that and I admitted to lying. I admitted to all of this, but not the murders and I didn't do the murders. I think it was his hope that the jury would see, look, he's admitted to all of his wrongdoing. Well, that he wanted to admit to. He admitted to all of his wrongdoing, but not the murders because he didn't do it. I wonder if that's what his game plan was here. This starts with, at its heart, the defendant's motion for relief from judgment pursuant to South Carolina rule of civil procedure 60b asks one simple question may i have a mulligan <laughs> that's how we're starting that's how we're starting <laughs> and not they didn't choose the word do over they really chose the word mulligan huh well <laughs> okay <laughs> Okay, Bland Richter, here we go. More aptly described, they say through their motion, Team Murdaugh, which includes Murdaugh and his counsel, have stumbled late on the judicial first T. This is too many analogies at once. Have stumbled late onto the judicial first T with a small bucket of balls and with the apparent attempt to fire shots until they finally hit the fairway. I There are too many reference, but I guess the mulligan goes with the golf reference, right? Isn't that what a mulligan is? Do a do over in golf, I think. So they're asking, th that's a lot of golf analogies. I assume they think that the judge is golf. So 
do, do we know if this judge golfs? I don't know. That's a lot of golf analogies. They have stumbled laid onto the first judicial tee with a small bucket of balls, not the small balls, with a small bucket of balls and with the apparent attempt to fire shots until they finally hit the fairway. Obviously, Murdaugh is not a golfer, neither are his lawyers. Um, what? Uh, <laughs> um, I, I'm not sure that this, it's obvious that Murdaugh is not a lawyer. I think maybe, or not a golfer. He's not a lawyer anymore. I, I think they actually probably are golfers and that they have the audacity to believe that there is a do-over. Um, this is odd. This is an odd beginning to emotion. Look, I'm normally here for the sass, but this golf analogy is kind of killing me. Okay. Obviously, they say Murdaugh is not a golfer. Neither are his lawyers. I bet that they all are, actually. There are no mulligans. Well, not in law. And then it goes on to say, like a spoiled child, the motion is overindulged and underdisciplined. Maybe start with that. Maybe start with the spoiled child analogy. There's too many analogies. Murdaugh's argument seems to be, quote, because I committed fraud on the court in the underlying cases, I am entitled to be relieved of my confession of judgment now, end quote. By this memorandum, the plaintiff will expose the many whiffs, slices, tops, blocks, chunks, hooks, and duffs that have so needlessly wasted this court's time and have unnecessarily caused the further victimization of the Satterfield family, thus entitling the plaintiff to sanctions against both Murdaugh and his legal counsel in order to punish their conduct and deter such similar abuses of the plaintiffs and the legal system going forward. Oh, God. And then they title the next section, Whiff. The, what? I Look, I am normally here for some creative, sassy legal writing. This is... For me, I need you to let me know. I am not a golfer. For me, this is over the top. I think there's room to make the spoiled child analogy with really concise argumentative writing, but I think this is written more like a press statement at the beginning than it is like a motion. Let me know if you think I'm being too harsh. I would really like to know. But this is, then they start titling their section on, on golf terminology they better hope this judge is a golfer i'm sure they know that this judge is a golfer but okay whiff is how they've titled section one one cannot point to their own fraud as a basis for relief under rule 60 look i don't think you need to title it a whiff i think you just need to say your own fraud is not the basis for relief quote whether to grant or deny a motion under Rule 60B is within the sound discretion of the judge. And then they cite the case law for that proposition. It says, while Murdoch seeks equity from the court, he has not discharged equity. Therefore, he is foreclosed from the relief he desires. And then they cite case law with regard to the doctrine of unclean hands, which means you can't get the relief when you are coming at it with unclean hands. They're quoting uh, Precision Instrument Manufacturing Company, quote, he who comes into equity must come with clean hands. It is far more than mere banality. It is the, a self-imposed ordinance that closes the door of the court of equity to one tainted with inequitableness or bad faith relative to the matter in which he seeks relief. It goes on to say, to put the matter bluntly, whose hands could be less clean than Alec Murdaugh's? That's the kind of sass I'm here for. Sure. Even according to his own motion, Murdaugh cites as a basis for seeking equitable relief under Rule 60 that he lied and misled his insurers in the court. Footnote one. That is if Murdaugh's latest quote unquote truth is well true. Of course, it is not to be unnoticed that neither in the amended answer in the Nautilus action or in the motion has Murdaugh's newfound truth been given under oath by affidavit or by verified petition. Instead, we are asked to accept the quote-unquote new truth of a demonstrated serial and pathological liar without a single shred of evidence other than his broken word to support his contentions. That, look, I'm here for a sassy footnote. 
You're now calling Murdoch a pathological liar within the footnote. I don't need know if you need all the golf analogies if you're going to come in quite that hot. Right? Back to the motion after the footnote, quote, that Mr. Murdoch lied about the dogs is undeniably obvious from the record now available, made more apparent by Mr. Murdoch's lengthy testimony at his recent criminal trial, wherein he admitted an unfortunate years-long pattern of drug-induced theft and dishonesty. Hmm. So Murdoch's still not taking responsibility in his motion. He's still blaming it on addiction. To paraphrase, they say, Murdoch urges the court he should be believed now when he says that he lied earlier about how Gloria Satterfield was injured, footnote two. Oh, bring the sass. We love a sassy footnote. Footnote two. As discussed, Infra Murdoch committed a fraud on three courts by his latest alleged about face, including Judge Hall, Judge Newman in the murder trial, and the South Carolina Supreme Court when it disbarred him. That's a delightful sassy footnote. See, I don't think you need to lose the sass in the golf analogies, but that's just me. It goes on to say, through a twisted application of Murdoch logic, the point Murdoch seems to make is that if he lied about the dogs, then the insurance companies never should have been paid him. Mm, that's an awkward sentence. Never should have been paid him the money that he stole. Never should have paid him. Just delete the bin. As a result of which he should be relieved of the confession of judgment that he gave the Satterfield boys some years later because there should never have been a Gloria Satterfield wrongful death claim and recovery in the first place. And of course, Murdoch gets to keep the stolen money. It's a difficult sentence, but it's a difficult proposition to explain because Murdoch's argument really is, and I said this at the beginning of the episode, Murdoch's argument really is, hey, because I lied, there never should have been recovery. So the Satterfields never should have recovered. And in fact, he's trying to bring the Satterfield boys into the Nautilus case, even though they didn't receive a payout from Nautilus insurance because Alec Murdoch and his buddies stole it. But he's trying to bring them into that case and drag them into another litigation in federal court and try to remove the confession of judgment in this court, which is deeply, deeply frustrating. But it, I think they've stated well what he's trying to say is because I lied, there never should have been a wrongful death claim. And if he lied about the dogs, then he's not wrong. But I think we're too far afield to unwind it now. Before we get into the rest of this motion, though, we need to take a break to thank our sponsor. This might be just me, but I find that in the summer, sometimes when it is particularly hot outside, my mascara sticks to the top of my eyelids and I end up with little lines all over the top of my eyelids. I appreciate today's sponsor, Thrive Cosmetics, because with their incredible liquid lash mascara, that doesn't happen. There is a reason that the Liquid Lash Extensions Mascara have more than 25,000 five-star reviews, and it mimics the look of lash extensions without like having to sit still and have things glued onto your face. It also uses a tubing formula, so it wraps around your lash as you apply it to dramatically lengthen and define your lashes. With Thrive Cosmetics, you know that everything is certified 100% vegan and cruelty-free, and all their products are made with skin-loving ingredients. But they also have a bigger than beauty promise, which means that a portion of each purchase goes to one of their more than 300 giving partners. It is time to try Thrive Cosmetics for yourself with our incredible offer. Right now, you can get an exclusive 20% off your first offer at thrivecosmetics.com slash lawnard. That's Thrive Cosmetics, C-A-U-S-E-M-E-T-I-C-S dot com slash lawnard. All right, let's get back to today's show. The motion continues, and this, Murdoch suggests, should entitle him to seek equitable relief from the court under Rule 60, footnote 3. Even here, Murdoch only serves up a half plate of his alleged truth because he never shares what became of the money he stole. Fair. He doesn't. He doesn't say where the money went. And I think one of the contentions I've heard Eric Bland make in the media is that it might have gone to pay lawyers. The Satterfield motion goes on to state that the motion, referring to Murdoch's motion, suggests that it rises, raises novel issues. It does not. It raises 
nonsensical issues. Look, if you're going to bring this much sass, drop the golf analogy. If the motion is novel, it is only novel in the sense that it is the byproduct of a disgraced former attorney with the time, depravity of mind, and sheer balderdash to have concocted it. That kind of sass I'm living for. Obviously, they are not thrilled that Murdaugh is now trying to claw back settlement funds and his confession of judgment and drag the Satterfield boys into more litigation. Balderdash is great use of word. But again, it's when you bring it all together, it's a bit much. Moreover, the motion is nothing more than a continuation of the mockery that Murdaugh has made of his prior profession and the administration of justice itself. Agreed. The fact that Murdaugh's latest abuse of the system and continued victimization of his victims is facilitated by his current counsel subjects all of them to sanctions as addressed below. Let's get to it quick. I want to see the sanctions. But before digressing, the motion is fatally defective and factually flawed in too many additional particulars to ignore. As to this point, however, the inescapable conclusion is that Murdaugh's admitted fraud does not entitle him to equitable relief, which is, I think, the the baseline argument that needs to be made. Murdaugh's fraud does not entitle him to equitable relief. That is That should be the point here. They've titled Section 2, Slice. Murdaugh has and continued to play, quote, fast and loose with the courts, which precludes him from the relief he now seeks. And then they talk about judicial estoppel. The doctrine of judicial estoppel evolved to protect the truth-seeking function of the judicial process by punishing those who seek to misrepresent facts to gain advantage. And then they quote case law saying the goal of judicial estoppel, quote, is to prevent a party from playing fast and loose with the courts and to protect the essential integrity of the process. They should have just titled this section judicial estoppel. He can't, he can't raise these arguments. He is estopped, which is how I remember estoppel in my brain. You cannot do that. There are different kinds of estoppel, judicial estoppel, equitable estoppel. There are different kinds of estoppel, but they should have just titled it estoppel and say he has stopped from doing this. And then they go through what the courts apply to look at judicial estoppel from case law in South Carolina. First, they say a party's later position must be clearly inconsistent with its earlier position. Second, whether the party has succeeded in persuading a court to accept the party's earlier position so that judicial acceptance of an inconsistent position in a later proceeding would create, quote, the perception that either the first or the second court was misled. A third consideration is whether the party seeking to assert the inconsistent position would derive unfair advantage or impose an unfair detriment on the opposing party, if not a stopped. It says this point is twisted even by Murdoch standards, but in his Rule 60 motion, Murdoch takes an inconsistent position with positions taken in other litigation by lying to this court about having lied about the dogs. Gosh, that's a challenge. So the argument is that Murdaugh's not allowed to make the argument that he lied about the dogs and the position of the Satterfields is that Murdaugh is actually lying about lying about the dogs and that the dogs actually tripped Gloria Satterfield and that is why he is lying about lying about the dogs. It then says what the motion advances in part as a basis for the relief is that, quote, Mr. Murdaugh lied about his own liability from Miss Satterfield's death to fraudulently obtain insurance proceeds to perpetuate his severe opioid drug habit. Motion at page 22. But they say, but did he really? Question mark. Yes. In an interview with the adjuster, it is, quote unquote, true that Murdaugh explained that Gloria's fall was caused by his dogs, a fact that appears supported by both Maggie and Paul at the time. Though I think Maggie and Paul were relying on what Alex said, and Maggie and Paul aren't here to tell us that because Maggie and Paul are deceased, as is Gloria Satterfield. But Murdoch never advanced this position to the court that approved the Nautilus settlement that he actually negotiated for a release that stipulated that he had no liability, footnote four. At his murder trial, when he supposedly was telling the truth about his prior thefts from clients and lies to them, Murdoch never testified that the dog didn't cause Gloria's fall. In fact, Assistant Attorney General Creighton Waters elicited testimony from Tony Satterfield that Murdoch had confessed judgment to the family for $4.3 million. 
No one from Team Murdaugh objected or took the position that the confession was a legal nullity. Obviously, they thought it beneficial at the time to have the jury believe that Murdaugh had made restitution to the Satterfields when they accepted the testimony without challenge. I agree with that. Agree. Agree. I agree that they thought it was to his benefit. Resuming after the footnote, it says, in the petition for approval of settlement in the matter, the factual predicate for the claim and the Nautilus settlement provided, quote, on or about February 2nd, 2018, Gloria Satterfield received injuries after falling down the front stairs of a Colton County, South Carolina residence owned by Richard Alexander Murdaugh and Margaret Murdaugh. Decedent Gloria Satterfield subsequently died. Omitted from that petition was any reference to the dogs. The petition was subsequently approved by an order approving settlement, a copy of which is attached as Exhibit B. The order found in part, quote, it appears that on or about February 2nd, 2018, Gloria Satterfield received injuries after falling down the front stairs of a Colton County, South Carolina residence. Importantly, the order further found that, quote, it is denied by the parties to be released that the injuries and the subsequent deaths suffered by the decedent were a result of any negligence or reckless conduct of any released party. So they're arguing that it's denied that the parties being released from liability were that the injuries were caused by negligent or negligent or reckless conduct. But it gets into the splitting hairs realm where the dog's conduct, is it negligence or reckless conduct of the parties or did the dogs cause the accident? Therefore there's strict liability. So I think there's argument there, but it's again, splitting hairs way too far after the fact. It goes on to say that like the petition, the order contained no factual finding that the dogs played any role in Gloria's fall or subsequent death. The order did, however, authorize Chad Westendorf as the PR of the estate to execute such documents as would affect a full release in favor of Richard Alexander Murdoch. Specifically, the order authorized Westendorf to execute a release as attached, which we've already covered in the insurance case. The Satterfields are saying, look, the dogs never came up. They settled it. The insurance company is saying without the dogs, we never would have settled it. They're saying, importantly, the release stipulated that Murdaugh had no liability whatsoever in Gloria's death. Quote, it is further understood and agreed that the payment of the above said amounts is not to be construed as an admission of liability on the part of the persons released, liability being expressly denied, which is very interesting. So how is Nautilus saying that they're resolving this if Alec Murdaugh is saying, I'm not liable? It's a very interesting question. It goes on to say, so assuming it matters and it does not, why did Nautilus pay the Gloria Satterfield claim? The reasons are many fold and are described in the second comprehensive report, which evaluated the Satterfield claim and was prepared for Nautilus by outside legal counsel, a copy which is attached, though that did indicate the dogs to my memory. The reasons Nautilus settled the claim include in no particular order based on the interview with Paul Murdoch, Paul, Paul reported the presence of his father, uh, he heard Alec asking Gloria what happened, and Gloria said, quote, something about the dogs. Paul also reported having been awoken by the dogs and coming outside to find Gloria at the bottom of the steps, footnote five, which says, tragically, Paul Murdaugh is no longer with us, a matter that will be addressed under spoliation of evidence below. It then says, based on an interview with Maggie Murdaugh, Maggie described that all four dogs were loose on the property. She was awoken by the dogs barking, and she went outside to find Gloria at the foot of the steps and that the dogs were walking near Satterfield. Maggie added that the dog named Bourbon was just quote-unquote horrible, was attention-seeking, and was known to get under people's feet. When asked what she thought happened, Maggie stated her belief that the dogs got in Gloria's way. Alec Murdaugh was not present at the time of the fall arrived later. Alec claims that Gloria told him the dogs tripped her, a fact that appears corroborated by Paul, footnote 6. One would have to question the value or risk of Alec's statement, he was not even present and did not witness the fall or any interaction between Gloria and the dogs. Furthermore, the fact that he had a financial interest in the outcome of any claim would likely preclude the admissibility of any statement made by Gloria under the dead man's rule. That was footnote six. So they went through the other things in the report, which I have covered in full. But in the timing of the report, it is very interesting about whether or not Alec concocted this story and told Maggie and Paul because all these statements are made after None of these statements are made at the hospital. None of these statements are made on the 911 call. So when we're looking at both sides of this, everyone got their story straight. But when was that story decided? Or 
when did that truth come to light? Because it said not at all on the 911 call. And that's curious to me. This motion goes on to say the real reason Nautilus settled the claim is that it made an economic decision that the risk of litigating with Murdaugh on his home turf was too great. I agree with that 100%. I agree with that 100%. As insurance companies do on a daily basis, Nautilus had the right to the free agency to deny the claim and tell the claimants what to tell others every day. Quote, unquote, prove it. Nautilus chose otherwise. And I think Alex saying, I'm going to accept responsibility, which was in that report, Alex said, I'm going to say it's my fault. So go ahead and go to trial because I'm going to go testify that it's my fault because the dog stripped her. Nautilus kept that in mind, I think, but it doesn't benefit the Satterfields to bring that up, which is why I'm bringing up the arguendo side of it. I think all of this is too late. I think they should leave the Satterfield boys alone and what's done is done. But we're in the world of legality, not morality. So I'm going to keep giving kind of the other side in doing so, they say Nautilus conducted their own independent investigation as to the circumstances surrounding Gloria's fall. They were assisted by outside counsel, and they negotiated for a resolution that included the stipulation that Murdaugh had done nothing wrong. Footnote seven. Not to be dense, but it has not been our experience that insurance companies pay out millions of dollars in claims without first performing an exhaustive investigation, obtaining opinions from their counsel to determine whether there is coverage under an applicable policy and making calculated business decisions to settle that may or may not have any bearing on actual liability. Yes, insurance companies generally tell you no. It takes a lot to get them to a yes. So to get them to a yes for millions and millions of dollars is tough. And the Satterfields are arguing, and that is within the right of the insurance company to do. They go on to say, as the orders approving the two settlements comprising $4.3 million has never been challenged, it is the law of the case that Murdaugh had no liability in the fall that caused the injuries and death of Gloria Satterfield. The matter was resolved for business and other insurance company internal reasons unrelated to any recently self-admitted fraud. And that is is a different position than Nautilus is taking in their lawsuit against Alec Murdaugh and a different position than Murdaugh is taking. Murdaugh is saying they only settled it because of fraud. And Satterfield is saying, you chose to settle it because you're an insurance company and you didn't want to spar with Murdaugh. But the other side of that is because Murdaugh was telling them he was accepting 100% liability. And Murdaugh is saying that was a fraud. These arguments are going to be interesting for the court to parse through. I don't think they're going to have to, though. I think the court is going to get to the a stopple question and be like, too late. No, you confess. A, no, you don't get to say later it's fraud when you confess to the court that it was true. I think that's where I don't think the course is going to parse all of this down to who, what is a lie and what isn't. I think they're going to deal with this on the estoppel issue. They say again, Murdoch has misled this court that the reason the claim was paid was as a result of having misled the prior court and approving the Nautilus settlement one can only imagine that when someone has manufactured so many mistruths, it becomes difficult to keep it all straight. But the reality is neither petitions, the orders, nor the releases mentions the dogs as it relates to Gloria's fall and expressly provided that Murda had no liability whatsoever. This is playing fast and loose and is out of bounds. But this is not the only matter in which Murda has and continues to play fast and loose with the courts as it relates to the confession itself that Murda describes in the present motion as a legal nullity he has at least twice acknowledged the confession in other courts as being valid, which is a very good argument. Related to Murdaugh's criminal indictments for having stolen millions of dollars from the Satterfield family, Murdaugh had a bond reduction hearing before the Honorable Allison Lee on January 18th, 2022. The negotiation of the material terms of the confession of judgment took place in advance of the bond reduction hearing, footnote 8. And it was important to Murdaugh to execute the confession prior to the bond hearing reduction for two reasons. First, he wanted to be able to report to the court that he had settled the disputes with the Satterfield. Second, he wanted to quell further opposition from Bland Richter to his request for a lower bond. So Alec had reasons to benefit from this. And then footnotes eight and nine. Footnote eight, a complete timeline of negotiation and the confession of judgment is set forth below and discussing other reasons why the current motion fails. And nine, Bond had initially been denied by the Honorable Clifton Newman. Subsequently, on December 13th, 2021, the Honorable Allison Lee set bond at $7 million. During the bond hearing, Dick Harpootlian told the court on Murdaugh's behalf that Murdaugh had agreed to pay the Satterfield family $4.3 million. This attorney admission is binding on Murdaugh. Look, Your Honor, he's relying, 
He's relying on this in court to benefit himself, to benefit him in front of the jury and to benefit him at his bond hearings. Clearly, when it served Murdoch's purposes, Emily, you should have kept reading because that's what they're going to argue. To advance the validity of the confession to the court, he did so. To be certain, the court accepted the representations that Murdoch had made matters right with the Satterfields as it went without challenge. One may suppose that Murdoch is now dissatisfied that he didn't get the value he sought at the time of telling the court that he would be signing the confession, but his perceived lack of value is no basis for a take back, a do over, or a mulligan. This is precisely the type of, quote, fast and loose conduct that judicial estoppel seeks to quell. But wait, there's more. On May 11th, 2022, Nautilus Insurance Company sued Murdaugh and others in the United States District Court seeking to recover the $3.8 million that it paid beneficially to Corey Fleming on behalf of the Satterfield Estate, which was subsequently diverted, i.e. stolen by Murdaugh. To be clear, the Satterfield family has never received the first dollar of Nautilus money. In its amended complaint, Nautilus agreed that Murdoch filed a proposed confession of judgment on March 24, 2022, referencing the confession is the subject of this motion. On May 1st, 2023, Murdoch filed his answer to the amended complaint, admitting the above allegation, thus stipulating to the validity, uh, validity of the confession. So even in his answers in the insurance case, he's saying that the confession of judgment is valid. Murdaugh did not take the position that the confession of judgment was a nullity in the federal court action. Just 15 days later, after stipulating to the validity of the confession in federal court, Murdaugh filed the present motion seeking to invalidate the confession. You can't do that. You can't argue one thing in one court and another thing in another court. You have a whole bunch of estoppel issues that don't come up very often because attorneys know to steer clear of arguing one position in one court in the same course of action, and then arguing another thing with the same client in another court. It goes on to say, perhaps this filing will remind Murdaugh to amend his federal pleading to deny the validity of the confession if he at least wants to be consistent with his lies. When it served Murdaugh to parade the confession before courts as a sign of his magnanimousness and contrition, he did so footnote 10. It's a long ass footnote. Again, by his silence and failure to tell Judge Newman and the murder court jury that the confession of judgment should be negated because, quote, I lied about the dogs causing Gloria's fall, unquote, this is just another example of Murdaugh trying to have it both ways as a result of his recent epiphany that he will now tell the truth. After the footnote, the motion goes on to say, when Nautilus said, in effect, thanks for admitting you stole the money we paid you beneficially for the Satterfield, we would like it back now, he reversed course and now seeks to disavow the same confession. That's exactly what they said. <laughs> the goal of judicial estoppel is to prevent a party from playing fast and loose with the courts and to protect the essential integrity of the process. Who has played faster or looser with the courts than Murdaugh? It's a good question. That's the kind of sass I'm here for. Huge thank you to today's sponsor, Manscaped, where you know you won't be getting sanctioned like these attorneys might be for not being smooth this summer. I know. Is there anything worse than not feeling smooth in the summer? Not ready to go for that poolside invite? You and your partner can both be as smooth as you can be with Manscaped's ultimate performance package 4.0 look the performance package 4.0 comes with absolutely everything you need because the lawnmower 4.0 takes care of all of the hair down there and it also comes with all of your added goodies including the crop preserver and ball deodorant i'm told that in the summer it's particularly helpful and i love the weed whacker ear and nose hair trimmers i love it so much it's so easy to use it's it's absolutely the best. If you have never, it is time to get yourself a weed whacker. And did I mention you get 20% off and free shipping? Yep. Head to manscaped.com and use code LAWNARD for 20% off and free shipping. That's code LAWNARD at manscaped.com. It's time to get warm weather ready. Let's get back to today's episode. The next section is titled Top. I don't even know what a top is in golf, so whatevs. It says the fact that Murdoch's legal team had bigger fish to fry does not create a basis for relief. Yeah, that kind of whoopsie doodle is not going to work. Quote, when the confession of judgment was agreed to, Mr. Murdoch's counsel knew that he had stolen the money. They were unaware, however, of the details of the claim and underlying settlement. 
in the run-up to Mr. Murdoch's murder trial and had no reason to delve into that issue. They had bigger fish to fry. Emphasis added. Simply put, wow. In all caps. Footnote 11 after the wow. Wow is footnoted. Why is wowie zowie footnoted? Let's find out. Footnote 11. While it is possible that the attorneys for Mr. Murdoch did not realize the downstream damage that could be caused by their counseling Mr. Murdoch to give the $4.3 million confession to the Satterfield to the Satterfields, the fact that they were admittedly outmaneuvered by the legal chessboard does not create a basis for relief. It is now clear and should have been clear at the time that the South Carolina Bar and the South Carolina Supreme Court wanted to act summarily to separate Murdoch from the practice of law, but they needed something clear and unequivocal, something like the confession in which Murdoch admitted to stealing millions. After the filed confession was received, the underside was duty-bound to provide a copy to the South Carolina Office of Disciplinary Counsel, and Murdoch was disbarred within days of filing the confession. I can't believe it says wow in the motion. In unpacking this one, it is probably best to create a timeline alternative to the one advanced by Team Murdoch in order to dispel the notion that somehow Murdoch's unwitting counsel got snuck up on by those dastardly lawyers on the other side. It's a bit much. As the timeline will show, not only is this untrue that Team Murdoch had bigger fish to fry, Murdoch had no other fish to fry at the time of the confession. And then it goes through the timeline that we have already gone through numerous times showing that the biggest thing going on at the time was really the Satterfield case because he was not yet charged with the homicide, which means they couldn't have really known, I suppose, that they would use it in front of the jury. They were using it on bail on the other cases because he wasn't yet charged with murder. That's fair. They include quite a fair bit of emails in this and normally those are things you would not see in motions, but after the other side already included settlement negotiations and motions, I'm not surprised that it's here. January 2nd, 2022, Eric Bland emailed Harputlian and Griffin, quote, Happy New Year. I got a call from Amy Hill today who said that she needs either a covenant or settlement agreement to submit to the court with the confession of judgment that we agreed upon. Dick, I recall you telling me that you were going to sign a confession of judgment and you would hold it in your file. Did Alec ever sign the confession of judgment? You also said that you were going to make a few changes to the covenant. I'm attaching it again. Can you do it so that we can get it over to Amy Hill this week for filing? There are motions scheduled in our case in a couple of weeks, and I want to be able to let Judge Price know that we are resolving everything. Thank you, Eric. And then they attached those emails to this. So they go through that timeline and email threads back and forth between the attorneys quite extensively running up to the July 14th, 2022 indictment for murder and then the trial for murder. They argue, in essence, Murdoch seems to contend by claiming his legal counsel had bigger fish to fry that he should be relieved of his judgment due to errors of his legal counsel. Well, if that's the case, go sue your legal counsel. While styled as a motion for relief under Rule 60b-3 or 60b-4, this argument is more akin to relief under Rule 60b-1 as a result of mistake, inadvertent surprise, or excusable neglect. As such, the question posed is really twofold. Did Murdoch's legal team make mistakes? And if so, does it entitle Murdoch to relief from his judgment? As to the first part of the inquiry, it is difficult to say that a mistake was made in a negotiation that spanned six months with agreements that were materially negotiated and modified by Murdoch's esteemed legal team and which were ultimately presented to the court for approval with their consent. This is especially true in light of the fact that the false assertion of frying fish has been completely dispelled. They then go to section four, which they've titled Chunk, saying there is no technical defect in the confession that entitles Murdoch to relief. Quote, next on the T, Murdoch contends that because of a technical defect in the confession that he and his legal team negotiated for over six months, asked a court to approve and paraded before other courts in other settings beneficial to Murdoch, he is now entitled to relief from confession. Before addressing the defects of which Murdoch now complains, it is important to first look back on the genesis of the confession and its terms. And I have covered the confession and its terms in other content, so we are not going to hearken all the way back to what was unraveling in the Mallory Beach case as we were running up to this confession of judgment in the Satterfield case. They are then starting to list out and argue against the defects listed by Team Murdoch, saying this is the reason the confession of judgment cannot stand. Defect number one, that the confession at issue states no facts whatsoever regarding the basis for liability. They 
are arguing to the contrary. The confession states that Murdoch admits liability to the judgment creditors for the claims asserted against him in the complaint. This is known as incorporation by reference. It doesn't say that though. The claims asserted against Murdoch in the complaint are factually rich and more important are admitted in toto in total throughout the confession. So they're saying, look, we all knew the facts that we were talking about because it's in the complaint. They say defect number two, the confession must show the sum confessed to does not exceed the liability in the complaint, which was incorporated and admitted into the confession as being 100% accurate. The Satterfield, the Satterfield described in rich factual detail how Murdaugh devised a scheme to use his position as a lawyer to steal $4.3 million and leave his clients who had just lost their mother with nothing, not one red dime. I don't know what that analogy means. The complaint included claims for breach of fiduciary duty and legal malpractice and included a prayer for punitive damages. While Team Murdoch has decided on their own that the Satterfields recovered in excess of $7.5 million, that the Satterfields had been paid enough, which importantly was prior to the confession, Murdoch stipulated in the confession to the liability for claims asserted in the complaint that he was subject to a punitive award, which means that the liability for punitive damages isn't exceeded. And that is part of what part of what was argued by Murdaugh that, hey, there was only four point three million dollars in liability. You've already gotten seven. Another four is uh, untenable. Next section five is titled Hook. Murdaugh's newfound concern for his other victims is not a basis for relief. Quote, the confessed judgment only harms Mr. Murdaugh's other victims. Motion page twenty three such that if the confessed judgment remains in place, these victims will have their restitution substantially reduced. While perhaps one should be encouraged that from the comfort of his jail cell confessional, Murdoch professes a desire to atone for the sins and to protect those he victimized, we find his motion in this regard lacking in sincerity. That shade I'm here for. First, it is at best a product of a very shaky memory to suggest the court that the confession works a disadvantage to other victims and at worst an outright misrepresentation to the court. And so then they go through a little bit more of the timeline of the confession of judgment saying, look, where'd the rest of the money go? On the other hand, Murdoch certainly knows how to work the system in order to give a judgment that creates the same inequity he suddenly seems duty bound to prevent. On September 15th, 2021, the Satterfield complaint was filed. On October 28th, 2021, Randolph Murdoch sued his brother for $46,000. The very next day, Alec Murdoch confessed judgment to his brother for $90,000 necessitating the receiver to file a motion for emergency order staying enforcement of the confessed judgment. On October 29th, 2021, Johnny Parker, former law partner and financier to Alec Murdoch, sued Murdoch for $477,000. On November 2nd, Alec Murdoch confessed judgment to his friend and former partner in the same amount, necessitating another motion for emergency order to stay the enforcement. So Murdoch is confessing judgment to others in his world for hundreds of thousands of dollars. Duff is section six saying pointing to other misconduct by the adverse party is not a basis for relief in a confusing rant with a vacuum of legal authority. Team Murdoch seems to contend here that he should be entitled to relief from his confession of judgment because Eric Bland called him a bad names on social media and or that Nautilus should seek money from the Satterfields and their legal counsel, footnote 21. It is ironic that this argument is advanced by Mr. Harpootlian, who has built a career and reputation for his bombast and use of the media. If our bar gave a career Mr. Microphone Award, Mr. Harpootlian would be a runaway winner. I don't know if we need to use the footnotes to take digs at Dick Harpootlian, but okay. Like we were good before we got a, if the bar gave a Mr. Microphone Award, I think we were fine up till there. Because Mr. Harpootlian, Dick, has built a career and reputation for his use of the media. That's true. After the footnote, it says on November 22nd, 2021, T. Murdoch filed an emergency motion for gag order and sanctions as to attorney Eric Bland about his alleged extrajudicial statements to the press and on television interviews, footnote 22. Aside from the fact that Rule 3.6 of the South Carolina Rules of Professional Conduct grants attorneys the right to correct false public narratives advanced by other litigants, it is ridiculous to posit that any comments Bland said swayed the public against Mr. Murdaugh. Bland Richter did not come on board until September 2021, 
anything that Mr. Bland may have said about Mr. Murdoch paled in comparison to what was said about Mr. Murdoch in thousands of articles published before Mr. Bland's arrival about Mr. Murdoch and hundreds of television stories. They got lost in the sass, and that's a really awkward sentence. <sighs> Continuing on with this very long footnote, while a powerful voice... Bland does not have the reach of national television shows, national newspapers, and other national and international media outlets. Mr. Murdoch was subject by the media and others of continued negative press. In fact, one would be hard-pressed to find any positive article or news piece written about Murdoch since February 2019. It's like, look, we didn't do it. He did it. It goes on to say, through the settlement agreement and the confession of judgment, the motion and all other motions were made moot. So, because of the settlement, everything else is moved. They then go on to say, nevertheless, Team Murdoch seeks now effectively to resurrect the very matter that they agreed had been resolved in order to manufacture a non-existent basis to seek relief from the confession of judgment. In truth, the motion really never makes the argument that connects the dots between misconduct and relief, but instead Team Murdoch loosely cites, quote, other misconduct in an attempt to divert attention away from the indefensible behavior of their client and nonsensical logic of their motion. To be clear, there has been no, quote unquote, other misconduct that entitles Murdoch to relief here. The next section is called Block and says Murdoch's spoliation of the evidence makes it impossible to put the parties back where they once were. And they are arguing that because everyone is deceased, there is nothing that can be done. I missed a footnote that was up above that I actually want to get to. So I'm going to back up just for a second because I thought they'd make this argument, but I thought it would be in a different section. They argue that the motion makes no accounting for those who actually received the stolen property and never suggest that Team Murdoch's own pockets should be examined for the stolen money. So this is talking about getting back that money that he took from Nautilus and footnote 24 makes the argument I've heard Eric Bland make numerous times before. Footnote 24 says, under Team Murdoch's argument, counsel for Murdoch should be included in any inquiry if one occurs about whether their fees were paid by Murdoch's ill-gotten gains and theft. By way of example, it is believed that Harputlian and Griffin were paid $500,000 to represent Paul in the DUI boating homicide charge brought in the spring of 2019 against him. Murdoch stole the Satterfield settlement monies in January 2019 and in May 2019. Did he pay his attorneys their requested legal fees with Satterfield monies or other monies stolen from PMPED clients? And that is part of their argument here. And now we are moving into the motion for sanctions. At some point, some line somewhere has been crossed by Murdoch where the court will send a strong message to him and his entire legal team to stop victimizing his victims and to stop weaponizing the legal system to exact punishment, to extract punishment. Surely the legal Rubicon has been crossed by the filing of this motion and anyone who facilitated its filing should be sanctioned. They go on to say that relief is available under South Carolina Frivolous Civil Proceedings Sanction Act. Quote, the South Carolina Frivolous Civil Proceedings Sanction Act provides for liability for attorney's fees and costs of frivolous suits. This isn't a frivolous suit. This is a frivolous motion. They're arguing that they should be able to use that act to get sanctions for this. They go on to argue that, quote, respectfully, no reasonable attorney who spent six months negotiating the settlement of a case that involved a confession of judgment, who then petitioned the court to accept the settlement and to permit the execution of confession and then use the confession in other judicial proceedings would wait until the eve of the one-year anniversary of the confession to point to phantom defects as a means to avoid it. That should have been the opening argument. Likewise, no reasonable attorney would misrepresent to a court that the reason the confession of judgment was executed in the first place was because they had, quote, bigger fish to fry and were not paying close enough attention to the detail when the fish they were referencing to, i.e. the murder indictments, did not even exist at the time of the confession in the discharge of our Rule 11 obligation to consult. Requests were made of T. Murdoch to withdraw their present motion in order to avoid the time and expense of this reply. These requests were unsuccessful, as shown through the email chain and attachment S, or exhibit S. The Satterfield boys have had enough of Alec Murdoch. That should have been the opening line of this entire thing. Their mother died at his home. 
For what is known now, it appears that by the time of their mother's funeral, Alec had already concocted a plan to monetize her death to his benefit. Alec lied to them. Alec stole from them. Even now, as they try to put back the pieces of a once quiet and happy life, Alec Murdaugh is literally the hand from the grave that will not allow them peace. We pray to the court that a sanction will issue against T. Murdaugh that will finally shake his grip. Respectfully, anything short of a sanction will serve to sanction his conduct. That last sanction is in quotes, arguing that if the court allows this to go on, it is essentially a green light for continued abhorrent behavior by Alec Murdaugh. And then they continue this email chain, which I am going to go through and summarize when we get to quick bits for the following week, because we have gone quite long enough on this motion. But I'm very interested to see if the court holds a hearing for sanctions, as I believe that they should in this case, to determine whether or not this motion falls under those boundaries of frivolous. These attorneys negotiated for six months and then turn around and say, whoops, we didn't pay attention. I don't buy it. And I don't think you do either. And with that, it is time to say goodbye. So grab a glass and say it with me. May your Wi-Fi be strong. May your toilet paper be plentiful. May your families be well. May your summer weather be delightful. And may the odds be ever in your favor. I will see you in the next one. Thank you for being a Law Nerd. You can find more Law Nerd goodness in our private Law Nerd community over at lawnerdsunite.com. And if you want to stay up to date with everything I'm covering, you can follow me on social media at The Emily D. Baker. I stream on YouTube on Tuesdays and Thursdays, and I recap those streams for those of you a little pressed for time over on the Quick Bits podcast and Quick Bits YouTube channel. Thanks for being a Law Nerd.